say, why am I in this situation when I'm actually serving you? What happened? You tell me, what is this? It's happening to me. And at one point, God left and come down to earth. And he actually rebuked his friends to let them know they are not, they're not important in this. You cannot tell me, God, you know nothing about my universe and the complexity of my universe. How dare you come and question me about this disease that's come upon you? And straight away, I think they realize that they are bitten off more than they can chew. Because you're talking about God himself. All he needs to do is utter a word and suddenly we become a speck that is just blown away. Um, Psalms tell us that we are like the shaft which the wind drives it away. We just dust before him and at one point the scripture tell us that we are just his footstool. That's all we are. So we are grateful that we can actually read about this and understand and reason together. But he was not sat in a courthouse. It was just Job putting all that the questions he had because of his friends around him, his wife, they were being used as tools, satanic tools, to, as a plague on him. So your own can become a plague, can become a tool when things happen to you. But we, are, we can see that God himself is the most important person you can ever discuss things with because he is the answer. He's got the answer. And we can see at the very end, Job latter was far more, far more outweighed the balance of what he had before. Because he was given more children, more beautiful, he was given more, more daughters, you could see, and they were more beautiful than any other in the land. His wealth multiplied. So it's not the former that matters, it's the latter. It's not where you start from, but it's where you end your ending is and sometimes people look at your present situation that like you come from a certain family so you're not going to make it you come from a certain district you're not going to make it you go to a certain school you're not going to make it but i know this is far more because job has soared all over his body and at times a sickness may come upon you someone might say how is it that you're in the church you're serving god and you're sick your body is from the earth and you can get sick but the main thing to do is to hold on to god because he's yeah. the he's a finisher of our faith no one can determine what happened to you except him because we see that job was so faithful to god that satan tried he walks to and fro the earth looking that's what he does he looks he looks to try to find to see who he can tear down, who he can attack. And he had to ask permission. He had to ask permission. Let the enemy ask permission to attack you. Because when they ask permission to attack you, they will not be able to succeed. Because you know God is on your side. And God was on Job's side because the enemy had to ask permission. So when we are questioning God, we must remember Testing will come to give us a testimony. It is not the former that matters, but it's the latter that matters. And our destination to make heaven our home is far more important and away the balance of what we may have materialistically. Because if heaven was meant for the rich, the poor like us will not be able to make it in. So we give honor and praise to God that we can read this, we can read it together, and we can come one with another to edify one another iron sharpened iron and that's what we're here for when we hear the term that he took god to court we think of the natural court but it was a reasoning he was having with god looking at his circumstances knowing that he served well and yet still he had such calamity that was thrown upon him comes what may says let us stand and let us walk, continue walking with God because He will take us into eternity. And that's Matthew's word. Amen. 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 Do I need to say anything? Yes, of course. 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 Of course.
say anything. I okay. Want, I want to know what's here now. Sorry? I want to know what's here now. Okay, okay. Okay, right. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, greetings. Wonderful um, <clears throat> explanation and of all of you. And, um, you know, you're all right. You you know, you're all, you're all right. But there is a little bit more, I think. There is. Um, and I'm going to um, just say, you know, what I've, um, what, I've, um, what I've thought and what I feel, what I think, you know, because yes. we've all got different um, ideas and different opinions about situations. So I'm just going to um, say what I, what I think, okay? Amen. And um, so um, we've had, um, we've had the three, is three friends and we've had um, Eliu. Eli speaks spoke last week, and we, you know, we said um, that um, Eli was apparently like a little bit, a bit of a, a bridge before the Lord comes in to, you know, to say what He wants to say, and um, He gave some very interesting arguments for and against. Yeah. And one minute He was with Job, and then He was with the the, the, the friends. But um, we've come to the point now where. Job is going to take God to court. Now, it's a challenge. You say Job challenges God. Yeah, and this challenge is is a, like a court case. Okay. So, in fact, he actually, it takes him to court in the sense that it's just the two of them. God is the judge and jury. So there is a jury there. There's God is the judge and jury. Job is there as well. And God comes down from the... Um, spiritual into the natural to actually you know um speak to job and um you know we, we, we'll go to that later but, but but before we get to that we have got to give consideration to job's <clears throat> challenge to god because he wants to, he wants litigation he wants to take him to court and in a way he does take him to court so i'll just um go through it um go through it now um i feel this is how I feel. So, um, now Job, from chapter 9, from chapter 9, Job has been thinking about what's happening to him. He's been desiring justice from around chapter 9. It's been a consuming passion. And then he finally declares that God is his opponent in chapter 13, verse 3. He finally declares that God you're against me. You're my opponent. And he also states in um, verse 18 of chapter 13 that he has prepared his case. Okay. And when you think of Job, Job lives in a community where he is a judge, so to speak. You know, he has judicial functioning in the system of his community. So um, when legal action seems impossible to him because he's thought about it, is continued suffering and what he's going through, you know, and what his friends have said to him just makes him think, you know what, I have got to challenge God. I have got to um, secure a litigation because I cannot go on like this. I need to know what is happening. He's now at the end of his tether and he admit, admits that he has transgressed like everybody else at some point in life. He's not... Uh, um, perfect he's not a saint so to speak he's flesh so he has uh, transgressed like others in in um uh areas of his life but he's very very aggrieved it's what it's the severity i don't think he wouldn't it would hurt so much if he wasn't in the situation he's lost his his family he's lost his home he's lost his livelihood you know everybody in the village is talking about him and, and laughing at him you know um, he's very aggrieved at the severity of the punishment that he is getting, and he knows that he has served God faithfully. Yet, you know, he speaks in in uh, chapter seven, verse twelve, as if he's done the the characteristics of Rahab, as if he's a monster. He suddenly become a monster. You know that everybody hates him. God is constantly hounding him and destroy, trying to destroy him. And, you know, this has made him quite strong in a way, even though he has moods and he, he goes from high to lows, you know, but he says, I have no intention of keeping silent. 
I will continue to speak out in the anguish of my spirit and I will continue to complain in the bitterness of my soul. And he says this in chapter 7 verse 11. Against the God who is responsible for his wretchedness. And he's thinking there has to be some reconciliation between divine justice and my suffering. You know, his friends are no use, but Job knows that something, there is something, something there. You know, and you know, he desperately wants to meet God, you know, to clear his name. You know, he wants to meet him to clear his name and defend his righteousness. And we see this in chapter 31, um, verse 37. And um, if we look at, um, um, if we, if we um, I don't know, you probably know this more than I do, but, you know, Jeremiah at some point, I can't remember the actual verses, but Jeremiah at some points, he would speak very boldly to God on occasions, you know, but Job has gone one step further because he's been hurling accusations, protests at God, you know, to actually proffer a challenge of litigation to him you know, virtually setting himself up as judge of God. And of course, um, no response comes to, to, to Job's um, challenge. He's is, 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 is got a litigation, but char charges have been filed. Charges have been filed, but nothing comes of it. You know, and in chapter 19, verses 7, you know, I've, I've got, I, I use the Amplified for this, where he says, Behold, I cry out, violence! But I am not heard. I cry aloud for help, but there is no justice. Mm. Now, in particular, he has charged God with wrongdoing, mm. which may be construed as charging God with unlawfully taking possession of his property. He's got nothing left. And this legal procedure would then cast him, Job, in the role of plaintiff and God in the role of defendant. We see this in, in chapter 13, verse 22. Now, we know that what a plaintiff is, it's, it's, it's someone who brings, you know, he's brought a, uh, a case, he's bringing Job. As a plaintiff, Job is bringing a case against God in court. As a defendant, if God is in the role of defendant, yeah, he is the accused in the court of law. Praise God. But there is also the issue that Job is also cast in the role of defendant. And if you looked at the same verse, chapter 22 of chap, uh, uh, chapter, Sorry, verse 22 of chapter 13. Job is also cast in the role of the defendant, if you look at it. Yeah? Because as a defendant, he's, all, he's been accused of a crime that he says he does not commit. So, you know, there's a little um, a twist there. The two of them, you know, are in a, a sort of a dilemma brought about by, by Job, if you like, because he's, he's, he's calling on God. Um, he's, he's calling on God as he's the plaintiff. And God is, is, you know, is the defendant because, you know, God is being accused by Job of wrongdoing. But Job is also the defendant because, you know, he's also been accused of doing something. So there's a little bit of a twist there. Praise God. And you can see this from his speeches, Job's speeches, which seem to indicate that God has brought a case against him and pronounced him guilty. And if we look at chapter 9, Verses 27 to 29, we see this. He feels that he has already been judged in a previous proceedings. So he has to account for his losses, what he's suffered now, as punishment for that. He's desperate to know what are the specific wrongs that he has done. And if he could only get some reply to his questions, his suffering would be infinitely more bearable. And now the friends, they, from their perspective, they also see Job in a, a position of, the de of a defendant, their arguments have sustained their beliefs that Job has already been judged and found guilty. While Job struggles with this, you know, um, what he's got from his friends, the friends are convinced that justice has been done because of the state that he's in. And if we look at verse, um, chapter 8, verse 3, where builded. We look back and says, you know, build it says, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? And even Eliphaz, too, when he concluded his speech, he had already reminded Job of this divine legal action in uh, chapter 22, verse 4, and defended the verdict 
by itemizing Job's sins that clearly led to his judgment. You know, and we can see that in verses five, uh, five to nine of twenty-two. And um, there's a little bit more there. It probably goes down to the end, but um, those are the main ones. Nevertheless, Job is convinced of his innocence, and he demands a writ of particulars. Yeah, and we all know what a writ is. It's an official written order. You know, it's issued by a court. Yeah, it's either a court or other legal um, authority. A writ. Now, Job wants a writ of particulars which would indicate that God has indicated proceedings against him. And in, in chapter 13, verse 23, he requests the nature and number of the charges against him to be specified. But of course, there's no answer from God. And we see this in chapter 30, verse 20. Now, this worrying silence of God drives Job to use the oath of clearance or some people may know it as um the oath of cleansing okay and we could you could we could uh, you can find this in leviticus 24 verse 20 uh, um verse of um uh, oath of clearance and basically the oath of clearance is supplemented by the law of retaliation lax telionis which means that it signified a statement of principle to the effect that the penalty was to fit the crime and not to exceed it. <clears throat> Praise God. <clears throat> so it's like the oath of clearance, Leviticus 24, 20, talks about an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot. So it, it's a command by God. So it's in, in Leviticus, and if you look at it, you know, you can re you can read about it. The oath of clearance. You can also see it in um, Exodus. It explains it in Exodus twenty one verse twenty three to twenty five, and it's also mentioned in Deuteronomy nineteen verse twenty one. Oath of clearance. Now, Job wants has to use the oath of clearance now because he thinks this is it. This is my last resort. Okay. So this course, he took this course as a last resort. Um, because there's no rational proof could be produced for the offence. And his appeal to God was made through this. And he had thought of using this before. He had thought of using this before. But even though he felt that it would be in vain, he now feels he has no choice. In his final speech of his dilemma, this is chapter 31, this is his final speech, Job makes certain states, statements, and this is where he's going to be using the oath of clearance. Commencing, he makes these statements, and it comments with, commencing with the conjunction, if, okay, if. So in chapter 31, he's saying, if, to, to um, uh, various conditions, it, it's all there if you, if you, um, Want to want to um to read it if to denote a condition and you can see verses 5 7 9 13 16 21 24 27 practically the whole chapter if to denote a condition which he denies having committed now these declarations are subsequently followed by a self maledictory oath that calls for whatever punitive measures the offense deserves yeah, and there's a, a, um, a list of those as well, from 8 to about 40. You know, there's a, there's a list of those as well. To give an example, in chapter 31, verse 21, Job states, If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, Remember that Job is a judge as well in his community. So he says, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. Now, um, chapter 31, there's a whole load of ifs and there's some thens as well. And, you know, you can see where they fit in. So this is what we mean by the oath of clearance. 
um, uh, yeah, oath of clearance or oath of cleansing, and lex talionis, 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 an eye for an eye. You know, so he's saying, if I have done this, then let the, you know, the the offence, let the, the the judgment, you know, be commensurate. It cannot exceed it. It has to be commensurate. So you know, you couldn't sort of, um, I don't know, make my own example up. Um, you know, if you um, if a man steals your your donkey, you couldn't shoot him because that would be excessive. You know, it has to be an eye for an eye. So you'd have to. To, 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 to give him another donkey or give him the money to buy another donkey. So an eye for an eye, a donkey for a donkey, you know, or whatever. So whatever the crime is, it cannot, the punishment cannot exceed, yeah, what has been done. So that's what your um, law of retaliation, um, uh, lex talionis, praise God, an eye for an eye. So it's, it's, it explains it very nicely in Exodus 21, uh, 23 to 25. Anyway, so Job has brought this into, you know, into the, the um, into play. And um, as his final testimony of innocence and claim of loyalty to God, he adds his signature to the oath of clearance and also registers his request for this writ of particulars that he thinks the Lord has made against him in a previous um, whatever, in a previous um, uh, a way, you know, um, why he is treating him like this. You know, his friends think that, you know, you've sinned and this is God's um, punishment for what you have done. So he wants a writ, you know, he wants an official order from the from the Lord to say what it is he has done you know so he's filed his charges and then now he wants a writ and he's uh, uh, taking he's, he's issued a litigation to God to say I'm taking you to court he's issued it but of course God doesn't respond he's issued it and you know at the end and he's brought in the um the oath of clearance so he's done three things he's issued a, lit, uh, a litigation to God He's um, done the oath of clearance, he's issued an oath of clearance, and he's demanded a writ of particulars as to why he's as he is, and to why God has done him wrong by treating him like a, a puppet and, and taking everything that he has, his home, his family, his livelihood, his cattle, everything, and he wants to know why. So it is a challenge to God, but it's, it's also... a um, um, a litigation process as well. It's a litigation pro process because this is what you do in the natural. If things like this happen to you, this is what you do. So, I mean, he can't, um, he can't, um, what you say, um, he can't deal, <clears throat> probably, he can't deal with <clears throat> God in the spiritual, so to speak. So he has to uh, deal with him in the natural and see what transpires. Because he's, he's, you know, he's flesh. Yeah, he has to deal with God in the natural to see what to see what transpires. So this is his final testimony of his innocence. He wants to see God. And in a way, he's very um, um, bright because he's drawing God out. You know, he wants, he's doing, you know, um, uh, his last resort. He wants to see God and he's drawing him out with whatever he can muster because he wants justice he's suffering he's lost everything he wants justice and the only way to get justice is to do this because this is his last resort so he's issued his litigation he's issued his writ and he's given his oath of clearance now <clears throat> and he said in chapter 31 verse 40 that's it that's it i have nothing more to say that's it and he's convinced his innocence will be confirmed. Um, 36 to 37, chapter 31, 36 to 37. Sorry, chapter 31, verses 36 to 37. He is convinced he will, his innocence will be confer, uh, confirmed. Now, Job's appeal, challenge and appeal to God in terms of divine justice, of wanting justice, is not an unknown phenomenon. You know, when you think about Abraham, he was equally concerned about divine justice. 
in consideration of Sodom and Gomorrah when he said, and we see this in Genesis 18 verses 23 and 25, and here I've, I've written the amplified version, when um, Abraham said to God, will you destroy the righteous, those upright and in right standing with God, together with the wicked? Far be it from you to do such a thing, shall not the judge of all the earth execute judgment and do righteously? You know, so um, Job is not the only one who's previously appealed to God for justice. You know, uh, Abraham might have been, might not have been, well, he wasn't. He wasn't in a predicament of Job, but he too, you know, saw that um, uh, Lot we presume that Lot was innocent and he didn't really know because he was out in um, where he was. A uh, Lot was in Sodom and, and, and Gomorrah and he gradually got into there because when he left Abraham, he was just in the plain. But he got uh, he got drawn into to, um, to Sodom and, you know, uh, lived there and he married there and his, had his kids there because when he was with Abraham, all he had was cattle. So he left and, you know, um, had a life, started a life there, and, you know, things just went downhill. But um, he was always, I mean, a lot his kin, and, you know, he spoke up for him, you know, and because Abraham was righteous in God's eyes, you know, he listened and, he, you know, he said, okay, and, you know, he, he decided that if there were 10 men righteous in, in Sodom, then he wouldn't destroy it. But, of course, there wasn't. So it was destroyed. But anyway, um, also, when you think of Abimelech, following his failed relationship with Sarah, cried out to God too in innocence of any offense. God's judgment which said, which said, you're a dead man, clearly seemed unjust to him as he had been lied to by Abraham and even his wife Sarah. You know, we see this in Genesis 23, uh, chapter 20, verse 3 to 5. And it may not have been a uh, a lie, such so they he may have misled him, but it was still a lie because it wasn't the truth. You know, fudge the issue, but it wasn't the truth. So he was, you know, uh, Abimelech didn't see anything wrong with taking um, Sarah into his home, into his, you know, presence. You know, and uh, even Habakkuk can relate. To Job's experience for justice, you know, we see in chapter 1, verses 2, where he's extremely upset at Babylon's success and prominence, you know, and he, has, he talked to God about how perverted, you know, the system was, the justice system was, had become in Judah, you know, injustice rather than justice, justice had become the norm. And he was really upset about it. And, you know, he kept calling out to God and he couldn't hear anything. And um, the righteous were de deliberately being syst and is systematically being oppressed by the wicked. You know, and when God eventually um, answered him, he said, the just will live by faith. I will sort it out. I know what I'm going to do. You know, uh, the just, just will live by faith. You know, I'm bringing people in from the north to carry out my orders you know, to carry out my purposes, to carry out my will, and the just will live by faith. And that is a, quite a seminal statement because, you know, uh, Paul uh, talks about it, you know, and, and Martin Luther talks about it. So it's quite a seminal statement, the just will live by faith. And it applies to us as well because, you know, it is our faith, you know, that keeps us on the right path and keeps us focused on God, you know. So, anyway, problems with divine justice arise, however, when you've got God in different roles. Now, going back to Job, Job called for a mediator in chapter 9, verse 33. In chapter 16, verse 19, he called for a witness. And in chapter 19, verse 25, he called for a vindicator. Now, God seems to have been designated by all these terms. Yet, even though Job knows God is also the accuser, the judge, and the executioner, he none, nonetheless appeals to him. 
He is therefore appealing from God to God. He places the totality of his predicament on God. What else can he do? Who else is there to turn to? Who else is there to go to? No one. In his pursuit for vindication, Job is pleaded as one oppressed, wanting a divine response. If I am sin, why don't you just tell me I've sinned and deal with it and let me die or whatever, whatever. You know? And he calls out. And again, I've heard use the amplified here. He calls out. O earth, cover not my blood, and let my cry have no resting place where it will cease being heard. And that's Job chapter 16, verse 18. So, Sister Burns. Now, let... Sorry? Sister Burns, so after accusing God, he's now at the mercy of God. <clears throat> well, he has to go to him. God is judge, jury, and, you know, he's, he's, he's um vindicator. You know, he is, he has to go from God to God. There's no one else he has to go to. You know, he's called for a mediator, a witness, a vindicator. And we heard pre uh, previously, you know, where um, we talked about um, um, Boaz, Kingsman Redeemer. And he talked about yeah. God in his Redeemer. And he knows he will see him face to face. But he has no one to, to, to go to. It's just, this situation is just between him and God. I mean, the friends are, are um, extra, so to speak. They've come in and they said their bit, but basically the whole thing is between him and God. He doesn't like what God is doing to him, so he has to appeal to him yeah. Yeah, as judge, jury, and as executioner. You know, which is it going to be, God? You, know, you need to tell me. You are all these. You, you know, you've got to tell me. <clears throat> So, when we think of blood, you know, Job has said in his pursuit for vindication, you know, he wants um, a release of whatever. Um, he's saying, cover not my blood. You know, if I'm going to die and go down to the grave, let my blood continue to cry out for justice. You know, let my cry have no resting place where it will cease being heard. And we know that blood is very important. You know, it's important to us. It's redeemed us. You know, and Job wants to be redeemed. And when we think of blood in scripture, you know, it represents violence and death as well, or as well as redemption. You know, we only have to look at Jesus Christ and what he went through and the blood, you know, that has redeemed us, the violence and the death that he suffered. And, you know, um, blood illustrates how three men has been distinctly acknowledged in the Bible. And these three men are able, you know, Job himself, and the Lord Jesus, the three of them, Abel, Job, and the Lord Jesus. Now we see where the blood of Abel <clears throat> cried out for vengeance against his brother Cain who murdered him. And we saw where the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ spoke a better word than that of Abel. And this tells, this tells us in Hebrews um, chapter 12, verse 24, the blood of Jesus spoke a better word than that of Abel because it cried out, it cries for mercy and forgiveness. And then with Job, his blood, metaphorically speaking, of course, because, I mean, he's alive, you know, he's, he's alive, Abel and, and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died, even though he's risen again, he, he died at the time. Job is still alive. There may not be any blood in his body or very little, but with his blood, metaphorically speaking, of course, his blood lies between the two, between Abel's blood and Jesus' blood because it cries for vindication. So you have these three illustrations acknowledged in the Bible distinctly. You know, Abel cried out for vengeance against his brother who murdered him. The Lord Jesus' blood speaks a better word because it cries for mercy and forgiveness. And Job's blood, metaphorically, lies between the two of them because it cries out for vindication. He says, don't let my blood, you know, let, let my blood have no resting place where it will cease being heard because I want vindication. So, um, <clears throat> here you have it where... Job brings up the particulars 
of a challenge, of a litigation. He wants to see God, and this is his last opportunity to draw him out, to, to see him, you know, to know what is going on in his, you know, with him. He wants to know, he's, he's desperate, absolutely desperate to find out why, 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 why is this happening, why, why, why? And, you know, I, I think some of us can sort of um, relate to that because, you know, we must have all, well, I don't know, but, you know, have, have appealed to God for certain things and, you know, we can't hear from him, you know, and no one has ever um, been in a situation like Job. No one has ever um, suffered like him. And he wants to know why. And, you know, the whole book of Job, you know, it's all about God <laughs> you know uh, Job is there and he's going through all this crisis and everything the friends or whatever but the book of Job is all about God and you know Job and one thing with with the book of Job as well you know you find that you know the enemy doesn't um, is not in there at all he's in at the beginning with Job doesn't know anything at all so you can see he's got such an intimate relationship with God all he's focusing on is God and why, God, why have you done this to me? He's not thinking about anything else, even his friends. You know, he's come out of the box and he, he, he doesn't agree now with what they have to say, even though before he did. He can see now that there's something completely different. And he's focused on God. He's really focused, but he's not getting any response. And he doesn't think about Satan or anything else. All he can see is God and it's God that's causing the problem. So you see that his, in, his um, relationship is so intimate with God that he is nothing else is, is God. It has to be God and he wants to see him and he wants vindication. He wants to know what is um, what is happening, why he's like this. The, the, you know, the, the book of Job is all about God. Um, the enemy doesn't get a look in. You know, he's at the beginning where, you know, it's him who's caused all the trouble. But throughout the book, he's never mentioned even at the end, he is never mentioned at all. He's got no part in the equation except to do God's bid, uh, to, um, to do God's purposes. And that was to, um, you know, um, um, destroy Job to the, to the extent that he did, but he can't, couldn't kill him. You know, he couldn't take his life. He could do whatever he wanted, but he couldn't take his life. So that was, that was him. And, you know, he's got no... He has not been mentioned at all. He has not been brought into the equation at all throughout the whole thing. It is just between God and Job. So, we have this now about his writ and his litigation and his oath of clearance. And this is the time now where the Lord comes in as judge. Yeah. He comes in as judge and jury and he confronts Job and this is where it gets really interesting but I'll, I'll do that next week as time has gone on but this is the part where you have to look at the litigation process it's in the it's in the book and it is um, a part of the challenge if you like you probably use challenge rather than litigation but the the, the scripture uses um, litigation you know because he is brought is bringing a case against God you know, if you bring a case against someone, someone, it's a, it's um, a case, it's a court case. You know, it's not. Um, what can you say? It's not um, minor. This is a big, a big thing for you to bring a case against someone. You know, because there is, as you say, there is a, um, a jury and there's a judge. You know, but it it depends on the um, scenario that you, that you're in. And the scenario is between Job and God, and God is the judge and the jury, you know, and God is also the defendant because he's been accused, and Job is also the defendant because he's been accused as well, you know, and Job is the plaintiff as well. So, you know, it's between the two of them, and there's these three areas, you know, that will be um, sorted out when God comes to, to, to speak to Job, and, you know, Job will realize that you know, he's, um, he's flesh, and, you know, he's uh, not God, and that God can do whatever he wants. So, yeah, so I'll, um, God comes in now, and, um, 
uh, he comes in now and um, he speaks to Job and this is where you get your you start to get all your questions to Job you know so yeah so that's that's all I have to say for this for this this um, this week yeah amen 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 my little bit is in there. Whether like when, when it starts, what is it saying? This is what you think. Can someone may think of something, think of it differently. Because you know, one Bible and um, emphasize this way, another Bible emphasize that, that way. And you say, this is what you think. See, I'm saying that they want to work on different views. Okay, we can see the challenge, the challenge between Job and the challenge between God. And my, now that I have here, what was God challenge to Job? What was God challenge to you? What was Job challenge to God? So it was a challenge about each other. It's a court case. So when he say, Job, take God to court, he doesn't mean literally court. Well, it's a challenge. It's but it's a, it's a court because it's just the two of them, and judge is ju God is the judge and the jury, and and Job is there. So you know, um, he's written a litigation. He's written a list of what he wants God to tell him about. You know, so he's he's saying this is you know I'm um I, I, I I'm proffering these charges, I'm proffering these charges to you, God. I you know, and I want an explanation of why so yeah it is a challenge which is, is also you know saying god comes comes from from heaven down to job's um uh, um area comes down to to in the physical to job and talks to him what you know and it says why you know yeah. well, well I'll, I'll go to go to that next week yeah. i'm not going to say anymore if you um if you're no believer i just come to church and you return job they got to go. They will understand you. Yeah. But for all Christians, they will understand. Yeah, I mean, but for new believers, they yeah. would they would understand because it's earthly words. These are earthly words, and people understand court. But they were like no Christian. They understand the word court because it's a word, you know, um, word. It's like when Jesus referred to speaking in parables and referred to earthly stories in order for us to have any meaning. It's the same. We understand what court is about. We understand the jurisdictional system. We know about the Supreme Court, the high judge, which is God himself, he's judge and jury. Yeah. So we understand it was two of them in court because nobody else can sit in here. His friends couldn't, his wife couldn't, and between him and God. But they said that he had charged God foolishly. Yeah, but he's still court. No matter what the verdict is, you still went to court. Even if, even if it's thrown out, you still enter court to plead your case, your cause. And he did because God came down. Let heaven came down to attend court about himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because God could have just completely ignored the situation yeah, and just said, you know what? But Job is such a um, a friend. Yeah. If, I don't know if that's the right word, but they're so intimate. You know, yeah. he knows Job so well. If he didn't know Job so well, he wouldn't have yeah. been able to do what he did with him. Yeah. He, he loves Job and he knows him so yeah. well, and he knows Job is going to come through it. Yeah. You know, he knows his heart and everything. But, you know, and if he didn't um, love Job and, and um, admire him as he did, he wouldn't have cared less. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say that really, but, you know, he wouldn't have uh, put him in this predicament, you know, to see what he would do because it's a test. You know, you take your best student, your best person in your eyes and you, you give them a task or you send them somewhere and you see what they do. You know, there's no one else he could have sent except Job, and he's the best of the best, according to um, uh, to God. You know, he's morally responsible. He always does the right thing. You know, and of course, he he does. He has transgressed because he's flesh. You know, he he was born a sinner, so he is flesh. And you know, um, saving grace didn't come until Jesus came and died for us. So you know, even his mother Mary, Jesus's mother Mary, was a sinner. 
So we're all flesh, we've all sinned, but you know, Job, you know, he loved God and he did everything right and uh, God, you know, put him through this test, you know, it was a test and it was a severe test, you know, and he railed, he railed at God for, for, for doing things and you could say that he did sin because he was always complaining and you know, God doesn't like complainers, you only got to look at the children of Israel, he doesn't like uh, complainers and Job did complain a lot, he railed a lot. You know, why this and why that? And, you know, if you, you know, you've got to read the book a couple of times, several times. And, I mean, there are still some things in it that I, I don't understand, you know, that is way above me. But, you know, this is just my little, mm. what I understand, you know, just my little understanding of it. But, you know, Job suffered. He suffered a lot, but it's, it was a test. It was a great test, and he came through it, you know. And all he wanted to know was why... And in the end, he, he never really got the answer he wanted, as, you know, we we'll would see. We, he never really got the answer he wanted, but, it, you know, he was satisfied at the end. So, you know, we go through, go into that later. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so what are you trying to say now? I'm telling you, that quote, that quote, that quote, don't tell me, it's another quote. No, when you challenge each other, it's not a quote, but in this particular case, it's a quote. Yeah. You're challenging the Supreme Judge. Yeah. It's like you turn up in Jamaica and you're telling Brian Sykes, Brian Sykes, I'm challenging you over A, B, and C. And only he alone can sit in there. But this is more spiritual. This is a spiritual one. The man who knows you in and out knows what you're thinking before you're thinking. Ah, it's a court. Yeah. You are challenging God, the Creator. You're telling him situation happened and it shouldn't happen. You're telling God that himself. Yeah. <laughs> You're putting in a situation that shouldn't happen. And as Teacher Byrne said, because he communes so well with God, he's a friend of God, in other words. God came down to commune with him. He could have stayed in the heavens. Didn't have to, but he had to come down to Job and say, Look, where were you? This, where were you when I was creating this complex universe? Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. You know, there's so much of it. There's a lot in it. That's quite that interesting. Yes, Minister yeah. Thompson. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting. I always look at that word when God said to him, where were you when I stretched out the heavens and so forth? So, yeah, 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 in other yeah, yeah. words, the God was, God, yeah, so God was showing Job that regardless of how good he thought he was, he was still lacking somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, he, yeah. he, he wasn't as good as he thought he was. He was good. I mean, he did what was right in the sight of God, but he was not as you know, ho holy as or, or righteous because he, God said, tell me where, where were you when I stretched out the heavens and, and yes. the court, you know. So in other words, uh, God expect, is, God wouldn't ask Job something that he wouldn't be able to answer. But because he wasn't that in the spirit to answer that question, he was lacking. So even as it came to what was said last week about God saying that he's righteous uh, and it is a, it's a righteous man. Uh, um, he was righteous and he did what was right in the sight of God, but the, he, did, yeah. he was still a sinner. Exactly, yeah. Because he, he was not born in heaven. That's right. That's right. He was born, he was born, he was born on earth. That's came right. To the same, came to the same system as everybody That's else. Right. That means to be. Same. That's but right. But the way yeah. he conducts himself, he conducts himself perfectly yeah. before God. Yeah. But at the same time, being in the flesh, he needs to communicate with God continuously to be saved from the flesh. Of course. But he was, but he was still short. Yeah, that's of what, yeah. that's what but he was. Yeah. Man concerning the conduct of spiritual things to God. But in the flesh, he's still a man. Yes. And he is God. Uh, the word in our eyes, he was not perfect because he flesh, but in the eyes of God spiritually, he had a wonderful relationship with God for God to come down to him. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so when we said when the question was asked last week, but how can he be perfect? You can be perfect spiritually yeah. because you're communing with God and doing everything. Yeah. It's right what you are testing in the flesh. Right. You need God to keep your short fall in the flesh. You need God 
to keep your flesh under subjection, otherwise you'll be running around like a crazy person. But spiritually, you can be very close with God, to God, but you need control of the flesh. Because you'll be running around in it. Yeah. You'll be running around criticizing. You'll be running around with malice and envy and strife. You need God. We need yeah. God. And some people think you're so perfect. If you're so perfect, you will not be on the earth. You would have no taken one's off perfect. You would have gone like Enoch. You would have no walked. one's perfect. You would have walked off with like yeah. Enoch. Our yeah. flesh is perfect. Yeah. It's not perfect, but our ways and our means, our spiritual side, can be yeah. perfect. We are we are Noah. No, yeah. it was Noah. But yeah. The writer said, "Let this mind be in you yeah. as in Christ. Well, not after the flesh." But after the spirit. So we are headed in perfection and we can be perfect spiritually, but the flesh side of us, we God. The yes. side of heaven with flesh, yes. Yeah. Yes, we need God. Yeah. So and when God not, called Abraham, God said. Yeah, when God called, um, uh, Mr. Cass, Cassie, yeah. when God called Abraham, God said, Walk before me and be thou perfect. Yes. That's what God said to him. But perfection is a road that we're traveling on. Yes. It doesn't, we are, it's a journey. Perfection is a journey. Yes. We, we don't get perfect in a, in a day. Out, uh, we don't get perfect. It's an ongoing journey. And as long as we're in the flesh, we're on the journey to perfection. Yeah. The only person that the Enoch. Bible says Enoch was pleasing to God and God took him. Yes, he walked with God. It's like a doctor going to university to be qualified. After he's been qualified at university, he's then had to come back to go into the practice, to practice his craft. And mistakes are made. But yeah. when the mistakes are made, he becomes perfect in his craft continuously. He is de evolving. He's developing mm. continuously until even mm. when he give up that craft, he's still learning because there are others that come in with new knowledge. Every day there's an increase of knowledge and understanding in the Holy Spirit that God inputs in mm. each and every one of us and we become more mature like daily. daily. Yeah, this is what, yeah, this is what Pastor Thompson is saying about being perfect because it's a yeah. journey. It it's is a journey. journey we're on. I mean, Abraham was... Um, you know, he wasn't perfect, and he, you know, yeah. you know, God said, "Walk before me and be perfect," because yeah. his, his faith was a stepping stone faith. It is. You know, it is. He didn't, it is. he didn't uh, do anything. No. And his father died. You know, before he left Haran, so Amen. his faith was stepping stone. That's you know, exactly, and once yeah. he got into um, Canaan, and even then, he went down to Egypt and didn't even consult God about it. He just went. Yes. And again, God had to go and get him out because yes. Sarah had Sarah in his harem. Yes. You know, when he had to, to, you know, went to get him out because she was, you know, you know, yes. she was um, uh, very important. She was necessary for yes. Isaac to be born. Yes. So, you know, Abraham was, um, you know, he didn't, he did his faith was uh, very slow to develop and say, walk before me and be perfect, you know, and believe. Yes. He has to continuously walk before God. It's a must. He must. He must. But it's, it's beautiful, as I said, when it can be discussed and it can be understood and we know that we have a way to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, give me a clap. Give me a clap. Give me a clap. I think you all, I mean, you know, that was very good. You know, it's nice that um, um, Sister Rosie and, and Brother Thompson you know, they gave their, um, you know, their, their, their views. And I mean, I know Minister Gals is very, she knows it all anyway. So. No, <laughs> but it was nice. It was oh. nice to put Rosie and um, Mr. Thank Minister you. Thompson, you know, because, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy because I know you um, uh, are um, seasoned people as well, you yeah. know, and it was very nice. It, you know, it's sort of, they all sort of, um, agreed with me in a way you know i sort of might have i don't know gone over the top a little bit i suppose in some ways but as i say we all got different um um opinions and when we look at scripture we we see different things 
yeah. so it was really nice to get you know to to hear what people said what you know what they feel about it i don't know i mean you know i was uh, as i say i still don't understand the book very very much but this is just my belief this is just my understanding of of it mm-hmm. you know and it's going to be yeah. different from yours as well you know because you'll have a different perspective but it's good the jewish part of it is very good to have that explain that is quite good because that's what we yeah. really We live in this we live in it now and yeah. it's good to have that to explain yeah that is very good and as you said we all come together to learn and we all have our input and we can learn from one another yeah. no matter how mm-hmm. we know we can still learn and we're very good where sister mclean this week we need her to be in court when she comes on sunday when she comes on sunday Pretend to say to her that we're we're doing the the, the job thing now. God take him to court. He take God to court. Yeah, we need to. Yeah. <laughs> we we need we need to get a written particulars for Sister McLean yeah. as to why yeah. she didn't turn up. Yeah. Just yeah. turn up to court. We need a written particulars. <laughs> <laughs> Where are they? Where's Mother Mills? It was very. And I I enjoyed. But teacher, when you must remember, I'm not a professor. Remember, I'm not a professor. <laughs> That's right, that's it, that's it. This girl, you are, you are yeah, a professor. Yeah, yeah, you're very good. I'm not, I'm not yeah, a professor. Oh, yes, you are. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Professor oh, Cassie. Sure. I, I, I told, listen, I told her, she didn't read her plan, I mean, they were treated on me. I said no. Oh, come on, we have people like teacher, like um, Sister Rosie, her voice is very clear. Her English is quite clear.